Okay, so we are going to start our the third lecture on dark matter. So take your seats, please. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Okay, good. Uh, so in the in the first lecture, we had a brief uh, review of why we believe there is some abundance of dark matter in the universe today, in our galaxy, and uh, even at larger scales. Uh, two days ago, in the second lectures, we uh, in the second lecture we went back in time and we look at possible ways, mostly one way. We look at one way to produce dark matter in the early universe that was thermal freeze out, and we derive a relation between the abundance and the cross section, and we saw that the relic abundance requirement, in some sense, give us an idea of how much dark matter should interact with us, okay? So, what we did the last time was exactly going back in time in when the universe was very, very young and uh, we studied the production of dark matter. What we do today, we come back to the present and we have an overview of experimental strategies to actually search for these particles. So, we will talk about three main ways that you may have heard of before of detecting dark matter, there are direct detection, indirect detection, and collider. And uh, it's good to start this topic by drawing a diagram that you probably have seen before, but just so this is just a more visual way of visualizing the annihilation process that we were discussing on, uh, on Tuesday. You have two, part, two dark matter particles arriving, finding each other, they interact, and uh, they give rise to a final state made of standard model particles. Uh, so I didn't emphasize that, but in the previous lecture, I was always assuming that the arrow of time was going from left to right in this diagram, okay? So this is my initial state, and this is my final state. And uh, if this is the case, so if time goes from left to right, this diagram describes an annihilation. And uh, we saw on Tuesday that this is the process that sets the relic density, okay? So the cross-section for this process tells us how much dark matter should be around today. What we will see today, the same process that happened in the early universe and the process that set the number density of dark matter can still happen today. For example, at the center of the Milky Way, our galaxy, or in dwarf galaxies around us. And uh, this process is how we do indirect detection so for now, I'm just giving you the name, but then we will review experimentally how you look for these annihilation processes. Now, the time can actually go in two other ways in this diagram. So if you consider time going from the bottom of the blackboard or the top, then you have an elastic collision. So you have a dark matter particle that collides with a standard model particle, and in the final state, you have the same two states. Okay, so it's just a collision where the initial state and the final states are the same. So this is the process that is probed in direct detection experiments. Okay. So it's an elastic collision between dark matter and us, standard model. And uh, I take advantage of this uh, opportunity to mention something that uh, was more appropriate to cover on Tuesday, but there was no time. But this is also the process that set kinetic decoupling in the early universe. So we saw on Tuesday that when gamma for annihilation is equal to Hubble, you get chemical freeze out. So number, species, number changing interactions are not effective anymore, and the number density is frozen. But these elastic processes can still take place. And this is what allows dark matter particles and the standard model particles to keep the same temperature until lower scales, lower time, until the universe, at times when the universe is older. And this kinetic decoupling process is very important because it sets the scale 
the small, the scale of the smallest object we can have in the universe. So, we you can uh, put a bound on this cross section by looking at structure, similarly to what I was discussing when I said that dark matter has to be cold. So, if you are interested to hear more about the decoupling, come talk to me uh, later. Uh, but since this lecture is about searches today, so we will focus on indirect detection, indirect detec direct detection, and the last option is to read this diagram from right to left. So this describes a collision of two standard model particles producing a pair of dark matter particles. Okay, so from right to left. So this is what happens, for example, at the what what could happen at the LAC. You collide two protons, they collide, and you end up producing two dark matter particles in the final state. So this is, here I wrote LAC, but it fits within a broader category, which is dark matter searches at colliders, okay? So the plan for today is to describe, without giving, of course, too many details, because I'm interested more in giving you the idea and how the experiment works and uh, what is the output of the experiment. So when you look at the plot, if you're sitting in a dark matter talk, you understand where the plot comes from and what, what it means. And I will follow this uh, order, direct detection first, indirect, and collider. Just, there is no reason to prefer one with respect to the other. It's just a choice, okay? Okay, so direct detection. So direct detection, the idea of direct detection was suggested in the 80s by Gutmann and uh, Witten. And uh, the idea is just to look for events of this kind. So the idea is to look for elastic collisions between a dark matter particle and some target. Here I call the target N. So this will belong to the experiment. And uh, it is typically a nucleus. We will see later that if it's large, it's good. So typical targets are large nuclei, okay? Like xenon or xenon and germanium are the, probably the most diffuse in these experiments. Okay, so. Before we get to, to, the, to the actual experiment, let's get an idea why we expect this event to happen in the, in the first place. Okay, so what we can do is to take a nucleus, of course we don't take a single one, we take many, but we put a nucleus in the lab here, we wait, and then if we see that these things moves, it means that it was kicked by something, by something invisible that we cannot see, and so by, oh, let me close. So if you, if, you, if you sit and wait and you see some recoil momentum and recoil energy without seeing anything else, so that means that there was something invisible because for momentum is conserved, so something uh, invisible kicked it. And the hope is to detect an event where this something invisible for the, was this dark matter particle. Okay, so how common are these events? What is the typical rate for, for these events? Uh, let's see. Uh, in order to give an estimate of the, of the rate, we need to know how much flux we have here on Earth, okay? So if I, let's see, if I consider one centimeter square, okay? One centimeter square. And uh, I consider one second. So one centimeter square is this big, okay? Here on my front, how many dark matter particle passes my head one centimeter square of my head in one second. Do you have any idea? 10, 5,000? So it depends, it depends. Because what we know is the mass density, not the number density. Okay, so the flux is number density times the velocity, okay? And the velocity we know that around the solar system, and in general in our galaxy, is 10 to the minus three times the speed of light, okay? So they are very non-relativistic today, these particles in our galaxy, but the number density, of course, 
is the ratio is the ratio between the mass density and the mass of a single particle. That's how many particles we have. So this is the number I, I give you. Cube, maybe. Okay. Okay, so we know everything because we know how fast dark matter particles move around our galaxy today. Yes? So the velocity is just hydrostatic equilibrium. So there is gravitational, there is gravity that wants the dark matter to collapse at the center of the galaxy, and then there is velocity dispersion that acts like a pressure, even though it's not correct to speak about pressure. But so it's a competition below, between the velocity, disper, dispersion of velocity and, uh, and gravity. And once you impose hydrostatic equilibrium, you you see that you need this velocity in order for the system to be in equilibrium. So the halo around our galaxy, for example. OK. So we know the velocity. We know rho. So for each mass, we can estimate the flux and know how many particles hit my head in, in, in one second. So let's, let's put one number, which is 100 GV. This, is, this 100 GV is. Uh, as we saw on, uh, on, on Tuesday, it's a, ma it's a very interesting mass range because there are motivated dark matter candidates from the hierarchy problem. They, they get produced with the right density, so this is a good target. And uh, we estimate the flux for this case, and we get 10 to the 5 uh, per unit surface per unit time, OK? So it's a big number. It's a big number. It's 100,000 dark matter particles hitting one centimeter on Earth per second. It is really a big number. It is big or not? Looks big, right? Now, for comparison, think about the neutrinos coming from the sun. Okay? Neutrinos produced through nuclear reactions in the sun. We get a flux of those neutrinos, which is if I remember the number correctly, it's 65 billion. Okay, so it's 10 to the 10. And detecting those neutrinos was a huge pain. It was really, really difficult. So we were not, probably none of us was born around those, some of us, but uh, so this is a, a success that we finally managed to, so we, I, I, I wasn't around, around those days, but I, I'm sure it was extremely difficult to detect these neutrinos from the sun because it's true that the flux is a big number, but the rate is flux times cross-section. And if something is weakly coupled, you need really a large flux to detect that, okay? So these numbers are just to say that direct detection is an extremely tricky business because we are really looking for something with a very small probability to happen, okay? Because the full rate is flux time cross-section, interaction strength, and um, it's, it's just uh, a very small number. Okay, so that's why all the direct detection experiments, they are never in this room or at the level of the Earth's surface. They go deep underground, like there is a, a lab here in Italy at Gran Sasso, and there are many others in the world. You have to go really deep inside the mountains where you reduce the background because, of course, if I put this bottle here and I look for this bottle to move, there are not only dark matter particles making that move. There are other things like cosmic rays and, and, and so on. So we want to reduce the background as much as possible, and that's why we need to go into some uh, environment where there is not much uh, dark matter around. Okay. Very good. So. This is one reason why it's difficult. It's because it's something very rare. There is another reason why it's uh, difficult. So it's, it's difficult twice. Not only because the events are very rare, but because each single event is very hard to detect. Okay? The reason why an event is hard to detect is that, of course, we don't see the dark matter particle. We see the effects of this dark matter particle. We see these things, this, this bottle or this target moving. So what we measure is the recoil energy of this object. And so let's try to make an estimate of what the typical recoil energy is for this, for this process. Okay, so the kinematics is this. So before 
So you have chi coming with with a given momentum, which is the mass times the velocity. I can use the non-relativistic expression because v is small. So it's, p is just mv, okay? And you have a nuclear target here, which is at rest, okay? So if this collision happens, then you see that, let me put maybe a vector. After the collision, both, both chi and the nucleus are moving, okay? And of course, we don't see chi moving. Chi is dark matter, it's invisible, it just escapes the detector. What we see is this nucleon moving, and so we can measure through some very sophisticated experimental setup, it's not an easy thing to measure, we can measure the recoil energy, okay? So, Direct detection experiments measure the recoil energy of the, of the target nucleus. So we can try to make an estimate of how big the typical recoil energy is for these processes and see that it's actually very small. So not only you have very few events, but each event is extremely difficult to, to detect. So where do we, so let me use this. So I will leave this, I will not erase this blackboard, so we will always keep in mind that this is the topic for, for today. But let's go through the kinematics, okay? So this is a very simple problem in, uh, in classical mechanics. It's a binary collision of two non-relativistic objects. It's something that you can use by imposing conservation of momentum and energy. So let's, without, putting all the factor of two in the right place, let's just get a feeling of what is the typical uh, order of magnitude. So the momentum transfer, which is just the final momentum of chi minus the initial momentum of chi, is defi I define it as Q, and the size of Q, the typical size of Q, is, uh, let me make sure I, Yes, so it's, this is just a straightforward kinematics. So as you may remember, there is the reduced mass of the two body system that enters the, the equation. And the typical momentum transfer is the mass times the relative velocity. The relative velocity is V because the target is at rest at the beginning, okay? So the typical recoil energy for the nucleus is, uh, well, it's M, sorry, it's uh, the momentum over twice the mass. Why? Because the initial momentum of the nucleus was zero, so all the momentum transfer went to the nucleus just by conservation. And I know that in the non-relativistic regime, the energy is momentum squared over twice the mass. Okay, so I substitute the first equation into the second equation. Okay, so this is the typical size of the recoil energy. Now, keep in mind that V chi is 10 to the minus three. V chi square is 10 to the minus six, okay? So typical, typically, both the dark matter particle and the target have mass in between 10 and 100 GV. So this factor within the parentheses so, so of the order of 10 GV, 10, 100 GV, you multiply that by 10 to the minus six. So the typical recoil energy, if it depends of course on M chi and on Mn, but you can convince yourself that it's in this range here, okay? And so these are very, very small energies to detect. And that's the second reason why direct detection is, is difficult. So two reasons why it is difficult. And uh, when we see the experimental results, we will be that it's, it's amazing how much they 
how much progress they made over the last 30 years and how much regional parameter space they were able to, uh, to exclude. So before I do that, let me just give you an expression. Okay. So there is another important quantity that plays a role in the experimental setup, which is the uh, threshold recoil energy for each experiment, okay? So each experiment can measure a recoil energy up to some value. Below that value, it will be just too small, okay? So you lose the ability of reconstructing that recoil energy. So I call this ET, okay? T stands for threshold. It's, it's a threshold below which my experiment doesn't work anymore. So now you see that, let me rewrite this very important equation. So there is a minimum velocity that the dark matter particle needs to have in order to observe an event. Okay, if V gets too small, then ER becomes too small, and ER gets below this threshold value, okay? So I say this because I gave you this 10 to the minus three number, but actually dark matter particles in our galaxies, they have a distribution, okay? And this distribution is, is a Gaussian, it's Maxwell, but well, to a very good approximation, but there may be corrections. But for now, let's assume it's a Gaussian. And this V0 is precisely 10 to the minus 3 the speed of light, okay? So once I compute the actual rate I have to take an average over all the possible incoming velocity of the dark matter. And uh, this distribution holds as long as the velocity is not big enough that the particle can escape from the galaxy. So the escape velocity is something you can estimate the same way you estimate the one for the, for the Earth, okay? Is there any question? Yeah. Yes, yes. This one, this is zero. The first one is for non-relativistic particle, yes. But I mean, you should just think that this is, this is not an equilibrium, not in the sense that you reach thermal equilibrium, just that you, you get a distribution in the velocity that it's a Gaussian distribution with the typical value V0, okay. Other questions? Okay, so uh, I wanted to say that because um, now let's compute the minimum velocity that you need in order to get a rate, okay? So the minimum velocity I just solve this equation by imposing that the recoil energy is equal to the threshold energy, okay? So uh, it's two mn over mu square e threshold to the one half, okay? And now I want to write down this equation in two, for two different cases, because here there is the reduced mass. So if you have a two body system, where the mass are very different from each other, the reduced mass is basically the mass of the lightest object, okay? So let's take the case where uh, the mass of chi is much, much less than the mass of the nucleon. Then this equation becomes two mn m chi square er, et, sorry. And here, instead, you get two et over mn.
Okay, so where, square, where, where? Oh, square root, square root, thank you. Yes, yes, thank you, thank you. Okay, so let's just go through the logic again. We see that if a dark matter particle arrives with a given V chi, there is a typical recoil energy that is produced. Of course, the smaller V chi, the smaller ER will be. And there is a point where we hit the threshold, which is typical of the experiment. If V chi is too small, then we don't produce much. Now, the reason why I emphasize these two cases is you see that V min gets large for small m chi, okay? Because you see that from the first equation. When m chi is small, the reduced mass is basically the same as m chi, and then you pay a huge price. And uh, this is bad because this, the escape velocity for our galaxy is more or less 600 kilometers per second. You can estimate that the same way you do for the escape velocity if I throw this shot on the air to just escape the gravitational field of the Earth. So this means that our experiment will be effective to test dark matter particle up to some mass, below which we lose sensitivity because the velocity, the minimum velocity I need for that specific mass is gonna be either bigger on the escape or you start to pay this exponential suppression, okay? So you lose sensitivity very quickly, okay? Uh, so for small mx, we see that we don't do very well. What about large mx, m chi? So I call it chi, not x. Uh, for large m chi, so it's very useful to write an equation for the rate. So now I will explain what I mean with this equation, but uh, uh, let me just write that first. Okay, so we saw yesterday that an interaction rate is typically n sigma v, okay? How many interactions per second? So this is n, this is sigma, and then I take an average over all the possible v with the distribution f that is here, okay? So this is just an average of n sigma v to give us the rate per unit recoil energy. And of course, I have to plug the cross section per unit energy. Uh, now, uh, let me rewrite this equation in a different way. As we already said, we don't know n, but we know rho. We know rho very well around the solar system, which is where we perform the experiment. So I replace n with rho over m. And once I do that, I see immediately that if m gets large, then I get less events. In other words, I'm paying a price because a bigger mass corresponds to a smaller number density around the galaxy. And so if the mass gets very large, eventually I get no events, okay? So we see that we have two bounds on the mass. We have a lower bound on the mass below which the experiment doesn't have enough sensitivity because we require a minimum velocity that's too large. And we also lose sensitivity at high masses because high masses correspond to a low number density, so we don't have particles coming here at any rate that would work, okay? So now let's go and see what is the typical output of a data detection experiment. So I will put that here. So now skipping many steps and a lot of experimental good work, uh, if you have a dark matter model where the, the relevant parameter space is is the mass, which I put on the horizontal axis, and the cross-section to scatter of some nucleon, okay? So 
let me put also some scale here. So these are the typical scales that these experiments probe for the mass. So above the GV, and by the time you get to 10 TV, you see the limit gets very weak. So uh, let's stop there. And uh, actually, I have a real plot here that was public only a few weeks ago. And this is the current best limit on direct detection. 45. Uh, Okay, so these are all small numbers, and I emphasize that the dimension that they used to plot are centimeter square. So when you read this plot and you say 10 to the minus 46, that's 10 to the minus 46 centimeters square for the cross section. And uh, if you look at the experimental bound that comes from an experiment that is called xenon one ton, so it's easy to remember because xenon is the target material they use, and one ton is how big the, the target is. And this is an experiment at Gran Sasso. And if you look at the bound, you see that, okay, something like this, okay? So this is the experimental bound. Whenever you see a line on a plot like this, it means that you are not allowed to live on one side of the line. And of course, in this case, means that whatever is here is excluded. And that makes sense, because you exclude cross-section bigger than some given value. You want the cross-section to be small enough, because they have observed no events that look like dark matter, okay? So, a few comments. You see that the rise here is very sharp, and uh, you lose sensitivity very quickly because of this effect I was saying here. So, once we, we mean gets very, very small, then your experiment is not going to perform well for that mass range. So, when the mass gets around 1 GV, the details depend on the experiment. The, the, the overall scale is always around 1 GV, okay? So, at 1 GV, you lose sensitivity, and then you're bound. It goes almost along a vertical line, okay? Below that mass, you cannot say much. So here, it's also easy to understand why the bound gets worse, because this corresponds to, if you measure the slope of this line, it's like 1 over m chi. And this is the flux factor that I mentioned before here, that you pay, because if you consider larger particles masses, then you have less number density, so you have less uh, incoming flux, and your limit is weaker, okay? Okay, yes? Yeah, so it is model dependent. Of course, it is model dependent, so, so it doesn't matter because it's a non-relativistic cross-section, so fermion or boson, it doesn't matter in this case. So, but no, but that's, that's a good, uh, it's a good comment because, of course, if you have a model when you know the theory and you can compute cross-sections, as a theorist, you can actually give, you can make a plot of this quantity, okay? You say, okay, I know the rho, I know V, more or less. I compute the sigma dr. With, with, with my Lagrangian and the tools I have, and then I, I, I compare that with data. Now, uh, for this plot, there is an assumption, and the assumption is that sigma is the so-called spin independent. Okay, so there, there, it means two things. First, the cross-section is taken in the limit when Q goes to zero, the momentum transfer. And that is a constant, that approach, so it doesn't vanish in that limit. And then there is the assumption that the dark matter particle interacts coherently with the nucleus and not just with a single nucleon. And so the cross-section scales, so the cross-section
to scatter off the full nucleus is the one for a nucleon times the number of nucleon that are in the in the in the in the target squared because you have to square the amplitude. So uh, there are some assumptions, but this plot is valid for this class of theories, spin giving spin independent cross section. There are other cases like spin dependent, where the dark matter particle in that case is a fermion and interacts with the spin of the nucleon, and that's another expression, and the plot looks different. Okay. So there are several cases, but this is. If you want the case where the cross-section predicted is the largest possible one, and so these are the best limits uh, available. So just uh, some, um, is, did I answer the question? More or less, okay. Yes? In that region, uh, I will say something at the end if there is time. There are new ideas using different targets, not nuclei, but these, the experiments, direct detection experiments, uh, the, the old uh, way, the one suggested in the, in the 80s, they cannot say much. Now, below the GV, there has been some improvement. There is this experiment called Super CDMS that they can really get to a very small threshold ener uh, recoil energy. So their bound goes like this. It gets worse, but not too much. But I think it's fair to say that it's a territory that it's uh, going to be explored in the next five, ten years, and there are many ideas to do that. Okay. Yeah. Can you some idea of models which don't have to respect direct detection bound? Um. Yeah, okay. So there are, it's very easy. If you play with these things for a while, then you can always find a way to hide. Uh, so the most famous example is actually the uh, a Majorana fermion interacting with the standard model Z boson, okay? So the process you have is this. You have chi, chi, then you have a Z, and then you have the nucleus here. And uh, if this is a Majorana fermion, this vortex can only be the axial vector current and not the vector current because you apply the self-conjugation property of Majorana fields and you see that the vector current has to vanish. And uh, this cross-section is spin-dependent, not independent. So you don't gain the, the A squared factor here. So you all interact with one nucleon, not with the full nucleus. And then the bound for that type of, par of particle is, is quite weak. There are other cases where sigma is proportional to V squared. And we know that V is small, so that's even more suppressed. So it, it is a model dependent. So there is a broad class of models where you, this plot is valid, but there are models where this is not. OK. Wow, it's already 240. OK. Um, OK, so let's conclude this uh, direct action with this plot with two comments. I'm sure you may have heard the neutrino floor, which is something like this. So there is a, an irreducible background to these experiments that I don't even know if it's correct to call background because it looks like a signal, okay? Neutrinos coming from the sun, atmospheric neutrinos, and other neutrinos, they give an experimental signature identical to the one of a dark matter particle. So by the time the bound will get here, then we will see something, but we know that something is standard model physics. Okay, so when you see this plot, there is also a shaded region here, which is the neutrino background region. But we are still, ah, they didn't put that here, okay. We are still few orders of magnitude away, so it's, there is reason to push this bound here, and that's something that it will happen with conventional, well, conventional, with the same techniques, just increasing the amount of material in the target and increasing the exposure time. And so this bound will be improved here. When I say bound improved, it means either we improve the bound or we see something and we discover something. As was mentioned before, there is all this region here, uh, GV, below the GV. And uh, this is, there is some bound there, but there are more ideas than bound, which is good. 
you know, there are ideas for new experiments to be built that were, they were put forward in the last five years. So it's a very active field. Also, with a substantial contribution from theorists too, not only experimentalists. And uh, there were a lot of ideas, again, something very recent, and some of these experiments will be built. And we will also explore this window. With the same caveat in mind that uh, in the sub-MEV region, it's tricky because uh, we know BBN, right? So having something below the MEV scale that is interacting with us strongly enough to give us a signal, it will probably be in thermal equilibrium in the early universe. So it will spoil BBN. And so there, let's say that I see two interesting regions. MEV to GV where there is really nothing to worry about. There can be particles living there with a good cross-section. We see that sub-MEV, we need to be more creative with the models because there are these BBN bounds. But they, there can still be models that will be tested. So yes? Oh, this one. No, so this is not the sigma. It's just the, the bound on sigma. So it's not a result from field theory that I do the calculation and I find that it goes like 1 over m. I'm just saying that if you look at the plot and you want to find an equation for this line, it's sigma is a constant over m. Because you lose the incoming flux by increasing the mass. And the other question, so I will, what is the boss? It, I have to finish at 3.15, right? OK, so let, let's do indirect, dete indirect detection. Then. If there is time, I'll say something about collider. Otherwise, I'll just do that in the right section. So before I start in the right detection, if there is more question about direct detection, think about that while I clean the blackboard. So if there is no other question, let's move and uh, let's look now at this diagram from left to right. Okay, so we want to detect something like this. Okay, Kai Kai finding each other in the universe today, annihilating and giving rise to standard model final states. So whatever I say in the last Half an hour will be true for annihilations, Kai Kai going to SM, SM. But it's actually true also for decay. So if you have, as we discussed, I think already before, dark matter particles do not have to be absolutely stable. They can be metastable. They can be stable until today, but with a long lifetime, long enough to be around, but also to give us some of these events here. Okay, so what I say here is valid for both, okay? And uh, how do we do that? Well, we need to point uh, our telescopes that can be either telescope on Earth or on satellites spinning around the Earth toward regions where there is a high density of dark matter, okay? Because we want this process to happen. So we need to look at places where there is dark matter. And moreover, this place, this environment where there is a lot of dark matter, they should not be too far away from us because if they are far away from us, then we lose in terms of the flux, okay? Because if they emit, uh, if this process happens and they emit isotropically around the environment, then we lose one over r square, one over the distance square, okay? So they have to be rich of dark matter particles and not too far away. So there are two main targets. One is the One is the center of the Milky Way, so it's very, it's, it's very close because we, we are in the Milky Way, so we don't pay a huge price in terms of distance. 
And uh, we know there is dark matter there. Okay, so that's, that's a good one. And the other one is to look at dwarf galaxies that are not too far away from our galaxy. And these are good too because they are small but they are rich of dark matter and they don't have too much background as I will discuss in, in a second, okay? So these are the places where these reactions can happen, but then what we detect is here on Earth, okay? So what do we detect? So what is SM in this case? Um, it cannot be something like a muon, if you know what it is. So a muon is a particle like the electron, just heavier, 200 times heavier than the electron, with the same properties, but it's unstable. So even if the dark matter chi chi goes to mu plus, mu minus, then the muon eventually decays, and it decays before you make it to the Earth, where we detect that. So SM here really means stable, standard model particles. So I gave the example of the, of, the, of the muon, but it's true for any other unstable model. So if you go to a couple of Higgs bosons, for example, in, in this annihilation, and then again, the Higgs boson is unstable, so you, you get the decay products here. Okay, so stable standard model particles, and there is not many of them, okay? There is not many, why? So we, we can make a list of the most popular targets, so let's see, neutral. So we can look for something that carries electric charge, like electrons, positrons, protons, antiprotons. We can look and detect these objects here. But then we can also look at something neutral, like photons or neutrinos. Okay, and uh, the reason why, well, it depends. So the, there are advantages and disadvantages about both, okay? So if you look for something charged, for example, there is the advantage that E plus is antimatter. The antiproton is, of course, antimatter. And we know that there, is, there are no many well-known mechanisms to produce antimatter in the universe at a very high energy. So if you observe something, which is positrons or antiprotons, at very high energy, it's something we don't know, and it can be very likely to come from annihilations like this, where the energy scale is set by the mass of these particles, or by the decay, okay? So this is what is good about charged stuff. The bad thing is that charged stuff do not propagate straight, because they get deflected in magnetic field of the galaxy, so once we detect them here, we don't know where they came from, okay? If you have a positron uh, being created somewhere in the galaxy, it moves as a consequence of the, of, the, of the magnetic field, and it hits our detector with a direction that in principle has nothing to do with the incoming direction. And uh, the other thing is that they lose energy. So once they get here, we don't know the energy they were produced with. Okay, so there are good and bad things. So today, since uh, I had to make a choice, because the amount of time I have is, is, is finite, I will discuss one specific uh, final state, which are photons, okay? So let's discuss photons in, in, uh, in more details. But I wanted to emphasize that when people speak about indirect detection, it doesn't mean only photons, even though I'm going to discuss only photons today. It means positrons, it means antiprotons, it means neutrinos. And so if you want to know more about the others, you can, you can ask me, of course. Okay, photons. So first of all, dark matter, we say that it doesn't interact too much with photons. That's something we discussed in the first lecture and also in the second, also in the Q&A session that was brought up, this, this issue. So how do we produce photons from dark matter annihilations? Okay, there are several ways. So let's make a distinction between primary and secondary photons. 
So primary photons are photons produced by processes like this. So the dark matter particle can go to two photons, okay? It may be small, the rate, but there could be a rate. For example, if you, we know that the dark matter doesn't interact too strongly with the photon, but the dark matter can interact with something that is charged. And then you go to the next, to the leading, next to the leading order in perturbation theory. For example, you compute one loop diagram, if you know what it is, and uh, you get two photons in the final state. Okay, so this is definitely possible, even if the dark matter doesn't have a, an electric charge that is big, okay? It's just perturbation theory, you go to the next order. Then there is also the possibility of producing photons in this way. You have, I don't know, uh, what can we do? W, okay, so this is one example. The W boson is the mediator of, one of the mediators of weak interactions. And uh, so the dark matter can talk with the W with no problem, it doesn't mean it's charged. But then these Ws are unstable. They evolve, they decay, and uh, you can get photons from, from final state radiation. Because it's true that the dark matter is not charged, but if dark matter annihilation produces something charged, then these final state particles, they can radiate photons. This is just bram strahlung of, of the Ws that are produced with the very high energy, okay? Moreover, through the, we know that the W, also has hadron decay modes, so it can decay to stuff that carries color charge, and in this chain you can produce neutral pi ions, pi zeros, and we know that the main decay mode of the pi zero is to gamma gamma, okay? So you see that there are multiple ways that from a process, well, you either go to two photons straight, and that's very easy, or even though you don't go to a photon pair, you go to W plus, W minus, then you follow the evolution of this W plus, W minus, and uh, you get, um, you get the photons in the final state. These are called primary photons because they are produced basically at the same location of dark matter annihilation, okay? Now, there are also what are called uh, secondary, secondary photons. So why secondary? Because they, are, they have nothing to do in principle with the production at the annihilation side, okay? But imagine that you have Kai Kai annihilating to something, and this something gives you electron or positrons, okay? Then what happens is that these electron and positrons, they travel through the galaxy, and they can, uh, excite photons through inverse Compton. This can be CMB photons, photons from stars. But if you produce electrons, they are very, these are very energetic because the energy here is, it could be hundreds of GV. So this could be photons with a very big kinetic energy. And they may hit CMB photons, photons from stars. And then you get photons that are at the energy much higher than the corresponding energy before. Like CMB photons are 10 to the minus 4 electron volt, okay? And also there is synchrotron radiation because we know that there is a magnetic field in our galaxy, so if the electron propagates in the magnetic field, it radiates uh, photons, and if you plug the number both for the electron energy and the typical size of the magnetic field in our galaxy, which I think it's micro gauss, more or less, you expect photons in the radio band of the electromagnetic spectrum, okay? So why I made this distinction? I made this distinction because 
from a single particle chi, let's say chi 100 GV, we have ways to look at the sky and at photons in different range of the electromagnetic spectrum because primary photons are produced at energy very close to the mass. But these secondary photons, like either inverse Compton or synchrotron, they correspond to lower energy, okay? And so we look at the sky with different experiments. We look for photons and we can also try to correlate if we see a signal or not, okay? So it's clear the idea, more or less. Okay, so now let's do something analogous to what we did with direct detection. Let's see how we estimate the flux, how we estimate the number of photons we expect to see on Earth, and how we derive bounds the same way, a plot similar to the one I drew uh, before. Okay, so how many photons do I expect? So let's make the estimate for one specific case so we can give names to all the particles and we know what to call what. Okay, so I have this example here. So we have chi chi that goes to tau plus tau minus. So tau is a lepton of the third family, so it's a heavier cosine of the electron as a mass of 1.7 GV, it's heavy, and uh, other than the mass, it's identical to the electron. And uh, our goal is to estimate this number. So I have a model where my dark matter particle annihilates two tau. I want to estimate how many photons I produce. For example, if I look at some dwarf galaxy, I look at the warp galaxy, I want to know how many photons are supposed to come to Earth because of this interaction here. Um, the way it works is the following. So we need to specify the cross-section, okay? So this process will have an associated cross-section which will tell us how big the interaction strength is uh, giving rise to this annihilation. And then, I write down the equation, then I will explain what I mean. Okay, so let's go through this equation and uh, this is a two, so numerical factors are not important. I just want to uh, explain the different things. Okay, so the flux of photon is given by, and remember, as I said before, that charged stuff gets deflected, but photons do not get deflected. So when we see a photon coming from there, we know it was produced there, because it gets produced and it travels straight to us. So we look at this dwarf galaxy, and we integrate over the fraction of solid angle that we observe the galaxy. And this is important because, of course, if this is me here, wow, well, no. Uh, okay, and this is a, a dwarf galaxy. So when, the, when I look at the dwarf galaxy with my eye, I'm only observing a given fraction of the solid angle, but photons get produced in all the direction in the dwarf galaxy. So it's unavoidable that I pay a price which is the total solid angle over four pi, okay? So that's easy to understand. It just means that the galaxy emits photons isotropically. We only detect the ones that are produced toward us, okay? This is also easy to understand because it's the integral along the line of sight. This is the line of sight, so I look toward the galaxy. 
of what? n squared times sigma v. Why n squared? Because they need two chi's to have an annihilation. They need the chi here, a chi here, and then they collide with probability given by the cross section. Okay, so that's why there is this combination, n chi squared sigma v. n chi is the density, the number density. As a comparison, if instead of the annihilation, I'm considering a decay, so if I'm considering this process here, so my dark matter is metastable and then decays to tau plus tau minus, then here, instead of n chi sigma v, I have the product of the first power of n chi times the decay width of chi, gamma. Why? Because I don't need two particles anymore to produce tau. I just need one and wait that it decays. That's gamma. N is how many I have in a single volume. And finally, this is a product that tells us how many photons with a given energy I produce per single annihilation. Okay, so imagine you have one single annihilation, chi chi going to tau plus tau minus, and uh, you want to know for that single given annihilation how many photons you produce with respect to the energy, so differential in the energy, okay? And this is something, by the way, that you can compute by using well-established techniques in particle physics, okay? Because this is something you can test at colliders, and uh, all you have to do is to produce two, tia two taus with an energy in the center of mass as given by twice the dark matter mass and follow the evolution, okay? So there is a very nice way to rewrite this equation that I will rewrite in that way, and then we will get to the experimental bounds. So let's see. Yes, okay. Okay, so I didn't do much. All I did, I took this equation and instead of n, I replaced n as I did all the time in the last week, rho over m. Okay, number density is mass density over the mass. Once I do this, then I collect this j factor that is defined here, and I write the rate as a product of multiple factors. And this is a nice decomposition because um, so let me, let me write that here, okay, so 1 over 8 pi is just a number and there is not much to say, okay? J, the J factor. So the J factor, it's something that depends on on the target only, okay? Because you see, by definition, you are just integrating over the line of sight on the solid angle of the square of the dark matter density. So this quantity knows nothing about your dark matter model, if it goes to tau or if it goes to w. It's just something that it depends on the target only. So you look at the dwarf galaxy and you must know that there is an associated J factor with that target. Yes. The cross section is uh, no, it's it's uh, it's not in the integral. The cross section is uh, I'm taking it as a constant here. Yeah, no, it's it's outside. It's outside. So this is you're just integrating over uh, matter density along the line of sight. So the cross section is outside. Um, now the second piece is this. And this is really where I have to specify what dark matter model I am considering. So if I'm studying, if, I'm, if I am writing a paper on a given dark matter model, and I want to 
see what is the flux of photons in that model. Well, J, I look for a reference, and these things are known. They've, they've been observed, and it's just something that doesn't know anything about my model. But once I write down my model, then sigma v and m chi, these are parameters of my model. I can compute sigma v, I can choose a mass. So this is a model-dependent quantity. Finally, so this is something that it doesn't depend on the target, and it doesn't depend on the model. This is something that is, I would say this is standard model physics, okay? So it's something we know very well, not only how to describe theoretically, but we know it works because we tested this at Collider for many, many years. And this is just a quantity that describes, given a single annihilation into tau, and given a dark matter mass, which here enters just as the energy, the invariant mass of the tau plus tau minus pair, what is the spectrum of photon that I get after I let tau plus tau minus evolve? So that's why it's other model physics, because this is something that it can happen in the vacuum, it can happen at, at the LAC, it can happen, um, I don't need the galaxy, okay, to describe this. So this is standard model physics. So this is a nice way to factorize the rate into three contributions, very different nature. And uh, if you are an observational astronomer, you care about the J factor, and uh, this is a very important job because there are still uncertainties on the J factor of dwarf galaxies, and they can be improved. If you are a dark matter model builder, you specify sigma v and m chi. And uh, this is uh, something that I think by now we can take from Monte Carlo codes that generate evolution of uh, type plus time minus pairs at the given center of mass energy, and we can just use that with a lot of confidence, okay? Okay, so now let's look at the limits. So now I have a plot from the, where is the echo? Yes. Uh, okay. So this is a plot from the Fermi collaboration. So the Fermi satellite is a satellite that was launched, I don't know, more or less 10 years ago. So uh, this result is the outcome of the observation of a set of dwarf galaxies for which the J factor was known. They specified this annihilation channel that I mentioned before. So this plot is valid for type plus, type minus. And, uh, and these were the two parameters that they use to, to bound the system because they say, okay, we predict how many photons we expect to see from these work balances using this equation. We count the number of photons. We impose that the number we see cannot be accounted for this. So this is an upper limit on the cross section. Otherwise, you would see more, you would predict more than what you actually saw. And then you put bounds on this parameter space. So let's go through the details. This is sigma v here. This is m chi. Uh, now, sigma v, they use these units, centimeter cube over second. So sigma is a cross-section, v is a velocity, so the dimension looks right. But if you remember, yes, uh, two days ago, I, the, the wind miracle, let me call it thermal, okay? There was this cross-section that was the magic number to get the relic density. I expressed this in natural units, but you can also explain that. Okay? With these other units. So the number we have to face once we look at the bound is this magic number. This is the number of the wind miracle. I just translated that from natural units to 
units where I restore the speed of light. Okay, so NH bar. Um, so let's see the plot. Again, what are the ranges of the mass? So this is 10 G, okay, let's just say mass in GV. 10, 100. So again, we are exploring a range of mass very similar to the one from the direct detection experiment that we just discussed. And on the vertical axis here, we have, what are the typical numbers? Uh, the typical numbers are 10 to the minus 27, 10 to the, uh, 10 to the minus 26, 25, 24. Okay? So we can immediately identify on this plot the magic. So this is the one, let's, let's see it called. So in some sense, and I, I remind you, this result was very independent on the dark matter mass. Okay, so we, we saw on Tuesday that regardless on the mass up to some very tiny logarithmic dependence, if the annihilation cross-section is equal to this value, then you get a successful production in the early universe. Okay, so this is an interesting benchmark for experimental uh, observations because in some sense you expect this number to be the one of, of your model. As I say, there are caveats to this number, as I discussed. There is an assumption about knowing the history of the universe all the way to very high temperature. So that doesn't have to be the case, but it's an interesting benchmark. So now let's go to the result and then I will stop. Uh, 27, okay. So this is the result from the Fermi collaboration, okay? And again, as I said before, this region is excluded. Okay. So we see already something interesting here that if the dark matter mass is below more or less 100 GV, thermal production seems to be excluded for this channel. By the way, Fermi collaboration in their paper, they released this plot for many other final states, not just tau plus tau minus, and they all look very similar, okay? There is not really a sharp difference. There, are, there, are, there, there is some difference, but more or less the message is, is the same, okay? So, uh, it is very interesting that we managed to test the thermal freeze out up to masses of 100 GV. Of course, this region is still viable, and uh, the fact that this region is excluded doesn't mean that these models cannot exist with a successful production rate, because as I say, this line has a big caveat. It was derived under the assumption that Hubble is the one uh, we we extrapolate from the, the thing. So uh, this ends the review on indirect detection. What I couldn't cover today was the collider searches, so you can ask me in private if you want. I will be more than happy to say a few things about that. And tomorrow in the last lecture, we will discuss the QCD action. That is a dark matter candidate that we never discussed until now. Thank you.